Hello there. Sorry about my appearance. I've been working on rails all day, I have. It's hard work, let me tell you. But lucky for me, they know just how to keep a bloke like me happy. <laughs> um, sorry about the books. <laughs> Matthew Jude, what's up? Uh, I'm kind of in the middle of something. Yeah, I know, but here's the thing. You gotta stop. Stop what? The accent. It's god awful. You sound like Don Cheadle in Ocean's Eleven. Okay, one, rude. Two, how did you even know? I got like a sick sense for these type of things, and honestly, it feels like I'm being stabbed in the brain. So. Oh, wow. Okay, hey, sorry, man. I didn't know. Um. Quick thought, though. If it's that bad, recording Death by Monsters must be a nightmare. Yeah, so then Jack the Ripper would come through and be like, Hello, 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 just me and my knife going for a cheeky little walk right here. <laughs> yeah, just having a spot of tea with my knife and my dead friend here. But pip, 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 cheerio. You have no idea. Hey folks, thank you for being here. My name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game because there aren't enough hours in the day, so I spend them reading a rule book. I mean, it's kind of my job, so I guess I have a good reason to, but you probably have better ways to spend your time. Anyway, today we're learning Brass Birmingham, an economic game set in Britain's canal and railroad eras, where you'll build factories, establish routes between cities, sell your goods, and steal your friend's beer, all with the goal of becoming the best industrialist out there, AKA earning the most points. This is a crunchy Euro, but one with a good amount of player interaction, to the point of being a little cutthroat at times. It's also, as of this recording, the number three game on BGG, so it's gotta be doing something right. Regardless, let's get started and learn how to play. Okay, so before we jump in, there are two quick things to mention. First off, despite my best efforts, I am still technically human, and as such, I'm capable of making mistakes. If that happens, I will be listing corrections using the Klingon subtitles, so please turn those on now, or at the very least, check the description box below. Second, this game was voted on by my Patreon backers, so I want to give a big thank you to them. If you want to tell me what to teach, Patreon is the only place where I might actually listen. Okay, now let's start learning brass. I'm actually going to gloss over some of the setup, because the instructions are pretty simple, and you'll end up referring back to them anyway, but there are a few things worth mentioning. First, there are two sides of the board, a day side and a night side. They are identical, they just have different artwork. Second, make sure that when you set up your player board, you match the numbers of each tile to the correct spot. And some tiles will have multiples, so just stack those on top of each other. And third, if you're playing with two or three players, remove the cards and merchant tiles that don't show your current player count. You'll randomly place the remaining merchant tiles on the various market locations on the board, but if you're playing with two or three players, don't place any in Nottingham for three, or Nottingham and Warrington for two. You'll then place beer barrels next to each non-blank merchant. So if you skipped any towns, they don't get any, and neither do these blank tiles. Once setup is done, each player will have some starting cash, a hand of eight cards, and one random face-down card that will start off your discard pile. Brass is played over two eras, the canal era and the rail era, and each era will have between eight and 10 rounds, depending on player count. On the first round, you'll take one action and then draw a card, but every round after that, you'll take two and then draw two cards and pass to the next player. Now, every time you take an action, no matter what it is, you'll play a card. Sometimes what's on the card will matter, sometimes it's just fuel for the fire. These actions will let you build factories, make connections between cities, sell goods, and do a few other things. After each round, you'll gain income based on your location on the income track and reassess the turn order based on how much money everyone spent. The arrow will end when everyone runs out of cards and there are none left in the deck to replace them. And when that happens, you'll score points and a lot of things on the board will change. But we'll get back to that a little later. For now, let's talk about some of those actions. Okay, so to be clear, the first three actions I'll be talking about, building, networking, and selling, aren't called industrial actions in the rulebook. I'm just grouping them together like this because I think these actions are very interrelated, so I kind of have to talk about them all at once. I'm also going to teach almost everything as if we're only talking about the canal era, and then later on in the video, I'll go over the changes that occur when you enter the rail era. Now, to get started on actions, we first have to look at those cards we drew. As I mentioned, every time you take any action, you'll play a card. And if you're building something, the content of the card will matter, but for any other action, it might as well be blank. Let's say we want to build. There are six different types of industry tiles to build, and whichever you pick, you have to pull from the lowest level available. 
let's build a cotton mill because it doesn't require any special resources. The cost is simply 12 pounds, which we place on our player token, more on that later, and of course, a card. We play this Birmingham card, which allows us to build any type of industry there. Looking at the board, we see that Birmingham can only hold cotton mills, iron, and manufactured goods. And there's just one spot for cotton, so that's where it goes. But really quickly, if I were building a manufactured goods tile here, I would have to place it on one of these solo spaces. You can't occupy a combo space unless there are no solos available for that tile. Okay, so we paid our money, we played a card, we built this factory, and now it's just sitting there. See, in order to get any value from it, we're going to want to sell the goods that it produces, which is going to take two things, a connection to a merchant tile that will buy those goods, and a sell action. Let's talk about connections first. A big aspect of this game is building connections. During the canal era, you can take the network action to place a canal token on any space that shows a blue line, representing water. This costs three pounds and a card, but this can be any card because remember, what's on the card only matters for building. When you build a canal, it has to connect to one of your industries or another canal tile. There's an exception to that, I'll get to it later. Okay, so the next time our turn comes around, we build this canal. This is great because we've connected our network to an appropriate merchant and also the general market, which is one of the main ways to acquire coal. Very useful, but for now, all we want to do is sell this cotton. Our factory is overflowing with shirts and we gotta move some product. Luckily, for now, this will be easy. Taking the sell action requires you to be connected, like we've talked about, and to discard a card to get things started. Next, we look at what we want to sell and how much beer it takes. See, the people unloading your goods don't work for free, and they only accept payment in the form of lukewarm beer. If you look at the tile, you'll see a small icon on the top right indicating how much beer is required to sell this particular good, which in most cases is just one. Some of the more advanced industries require two, but also some of them just fly off the shelves and don't need any. In our case, we need one, but wouldn't you know it, the city brought its own. We don't need to pay for this beer, we just discard it. In fact, the city is so happy we took the beer off their hands, they've rewarded us with a little income boost. More on that in a second. So we took the action, drank some beer, and now we flip the tile. We won't be able to sell from here again, but we will get some victory points and a link bonus that will count at the end of the era, and some income that will count right now. Whenever you gain income, move your income marker forward the amount of spaces shown. So the cotton got us six, and that beer bonus got us two. The gold coin is how much we'll make per round, but we move along these black circles, so it can take a little bit of time to build up a powerful economy. Okay, so that was a very basic look at building, networking, and selling, but there are a few things I skipped over and a few very key details I've yet to discuss. Let's go back to building. The first thing we built was in Birmingham, and we played a city card for it, which allowed us to do that, but not all cards show cities. Some of them show industries. If you build using an industry card, you can build that industry on any city with a matching space, but only if it's part of your network, which in the canal era means you need to have an adjacent canal. And remember, making canals is the same. They have to be next to your industries or link up with your other canals. The exception to this is at the beginning of the game when you don't have anything on the board. If this is the case, you can use an industry card to build a tile in any city, again, provided it has an appropriate spot, or any card to put a canal in any water space but once you've got a single piece of cardboard on the map, that exception is gone. And one last thing about building, during the canal era, each player can only build one industry per city. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is what sets brass apart from a lot of other games in this genre. Besides money, there are three resources in the game, beer, iron, and coal. Beer we've talked about a little bit, but there's more fun stuff down the road. Iron and coal are pretty standard resources. Some buildings require them, there's a public market you can buy them from, but players can also produce all three of these resources, and this is where things get a little funky. First off, whenever you build an industry tile that produces a resource, check the tile for how many it makes. Iron and coal depend on the building's level, but for beer it's always one barrel in the canal era and two in the rail era. But that's not the exciting part. See, if you need to use a resource and you're able to take it from a spot on the map instead of the market, you not only can do this for free, you have to. There's some nuance to it, but the main takeaway is every resource except money lives on the board and can be used by any player, provided they meet a few prerequisites. Let's start with the iron because it's the easiest. Iron doesn't require a connection. If someone built an ironworks and you need iron, you can use that iron. If you need more than one, you can take from different factories or all from the same place, dealer's choice. If there isn't any iron on the map, you have to buy it from the market. But again, you don't need anything special for this. You simply pay the current cost for each cube you take. And if there's none left in the market, just take from the supply and pay the maximum price. So six pounds each. Coal works in a very similar way, but you need to draw a connection from the space you're building to the source of the coal. And this can go through opponent's links as well as your own. 
Also, you have to take from the closest source first, moving outward once the source is expended. If you can't take from the map, but you're connected to the market, i.e. any of the big cities that show coal on them, then you can buy from the market just like iron. And lastly, beer. We've seen how you can take the free beer from the merchants and get a reward, but you can also take it from breweries, and like iron, you can choose the source. However, as with coal, if you want to use someone else's beer, you have to connect to it. But another, however, if you made a brewery somewhere, you can use that beer even if it isn't part of your network. Don't ask me how that teleportation works, I don't know, but there is a little reminder of all this on the board. Coal needs a connection, iron doesn't. Other people's beer needs connections, your beer doesn't. The top hat is you in this scenario. Now, you're probably wondering why you would ever want to build resources if other people are just going to come in and take them. Well, that's a good question, hypothetical viewer. I'm so glad I made you ask. There are two reasons. First off, if you make iron or coal and the market has open spaces, you must immediately sell them at the going rate. So here we could sell the four iron we just produced for six pounds total. Two for two and then two for one. And again, if you want to sell coal, you have to be connected to the market. Unfortunately, if you build a coal mine when you aren't connected and then connect later, even if there's demand, you don't get to sell it. That can only happen immediately after building. Now, if you've made an industry that produces resources and all of its resources get used, regardless of how it happens, the tile flips and you're going to get those same benefits we saw earlier from the cotton mill, but this time with no sell action required. So as you can see, there are definitely benefits even if someone ruthlessly steals all your booze. Okay, now that we've learned some more in-depth mechanics, let's see another example. We want to build this ironworks because we know that there's a high demand for it. So as soon as we place it, all that iron is going to sell. And looking at our player board, we can also see that a flipped ironworks will be worth three points and will bump our income up three notches. It costs five pounds and a coal. We have the money and this ironworks card. So now we need to find an appropriate spot on the map. There are a few spots that are connected to our network, but we aren't connected to the market yet. However, we are connected to our opponent's network, and they happen to have a coal mine. Two, in fact. So we pay the cost, consume a coal from the closer coal mine, sell all of our iron, and reap the rewards. Now we're almost ready to move on, but there are a couple quick things to mention before we do. First off, if you're taking a sell action, you can sell from multiple industries, but you need to pay the beer cost for each tile you flip. Second, some buildings can only be built during the canal or rail eras, and there are icons to show which are which. Third, in a two or three player game, even though some city cards aren't in the deck, you can still build in those missing locations. Fourth, and this one is rare, but you might occasionally want to replace an industry tile that's on the board. This is called overbuilding, and you can only do so if you replace it with a more advanced version of the same industry. Also, if there were resources on the tile, they don't carry over. Whatever the new tile produces, that's all you get. And lastly, for overbuilding, you can overbuild an opponent's industry, but only if it's a coal mine or ironworks, and there have to be no matching resource cubes on the map or in the market. Replaced tiles are removed and will not be scored, but you don't lose the income you gained from them. And the last thing before we talk about the other actions, there are two farm breweries on the board that aren't connected to any city. Obviously, you can't use a city card to make a brewery there, and in order to connect to this one, all you need is a link between Kidderminster and Worcester. Worcester? Workster? That doesn't sound right. Hold on a sec. Hey, how do you pronounce- It's just Worcester. How is it Wooster? I can't explain it to you. It just is. There are so many letters that aren't being said. Okay, so before we get to all the changes that happened during the rail era, there are a few quick actions left to talk about. Let's start with scouting. When you take this action, you'll discard two cards, and that's in addition to the one card you spent to take the action in the first place. And then you'll get to draw one wild city card and one wild industry card. As you can probably guess, these cards can be used in place of any city or any industry when taking a build action. You can only have one of each of these cards at any given time, and you can't scout again until both have been played. Also, when you play them, instead of going to your discard pile, they go back to their spot on the board. Next up, we have the loan action. You'll probably run out of your starting funds pretty quickly, and as a millennial, I know how much this will hurt to hear, but taking out a loan is a pretty good way to help with that. You discard a card as always, and then take 30 pounds from the bank. Seems great so far, but then you're going to move your income down a bit. This is different from increasing your income, though. When you increase, you go up one space at a time. When you take out a loan, you go down by three income levels, like so, ending on the highest spot in that level. You don't need to worry about paying it back, because technically they've garnished your wages here, but keep in mind that you can't take this action if it would put you below negative 10 income. 
Next up, we have the develop action, and this might seem a little weird at first. When you develop, discard a card as per use, and then you can pay one or two iron to discard one or two industry tiles from your board, pulling from the lowest level of whatever industries you choose. You won't be able to build them anymore, but you've probably noticed that higher level industries are more valuable. And some tiles, like the level two and four pottery buildings, are garbage, so it might be better to toss them than actually put them on the map. However, the other pottery tiles can't be developed, as shown by this crossed out light bulb symbol, so you can't just blitz through them to get to the best ones. Oh, and just FYI, this reward space in Gloucester lets you develop one tile for free. Lastly, if you don't want to take any other action, you can pass, but even passing requires you to discard a card, and you still need to take two actions, so if you want to completely skip your turn, you have to pass twice. Long story short, you usually won't want to do this. Anyway, as a reminder, once you've taken your turn, draw back up to eight cards if you can, and then the next player goes. Once each player has taken a turn, the round ends, and you'll do two things, reset the turn order and gain income. As I mentioned earlier, every time you pay money on your turn, it goes onto your player portrait. Count how much money each player has spent, and rearrange the portraits from least to most, setting your new turn order for the round. If anyone was tied, they'll keep their relative orders. Next, look at each player's income marker and pay out the amount that corresponds to their income level, i.e. the gold number, not the black number. And if you have a negative number, that means you're losing money, not gaining any. If you don't have enough money to pay your balance, you'll have to sell industry tiles, gaining half their cost. This is the only time you're able to sell your industries in this way, and you'll keep any extra cash, but you need to stop selling as soon as you're able to pay off your debt. If you still don't have enough, you'll lose a point for each pound you owe, so be careful about those loans, folks. Once that's done, you'll start a new round. That is, unless everyone is completely out of cards, in which case the canal era is done, and you'll switch over to the rail era. When this happens, you're going to score a few things, and the board will be almost completely reset. Starting with scoring, for each link tile you built, score points for every link bonus on connected industries, whether you own them or not. The market cities also have link bonuses, so make sure to count those too. Here we built a canal between two very popular cities. We only have one flipped industry, but the other players have a few, so we count up all these link bonuses and score that many points. After counting each link, remove the tile from the board. Then check the point value of each of your flipped industry tiles. This one's pretty simple, you just add them all up. Next, remove all obsolete industries, which are tiles that show this little one in the corner. Once that's done, you'll replace merchant beer in every market city with a non-blank merchant tile. And shuffle every player's discard pile into a new draw deck and deal out eight cards. You're now ready to start the rail era, so let's talk about how things are different here. First off, unlike in the first round of the canal era, on your first turn of the rail era, you get to play two actions, just like any other round. Next, you can't build any canal era industries, which are shown by this symbol. So if you have any still on your board, you'll need to develop them away if you want to build along that line. However, when building industries, players can now place multiple tiles in the same city. And lastly, since the canal era is over, you can't build canals anymore. You have to build railroads. These are largely similar to canals, but obviously you need to place them on rail spaces now. Also, rails are a little more expensive, costing five pounds and one coal for one rail. Or if you want, you can build two rails in one action, but this costs 15 pounds, two coal, and one beer. So you'll get a lot done, but it's gonna cost you. And that beer must come from a brewery. It can't come from a merchant space. Once the rail era is complete, you'll count up scores in exactly the same way as you did at the end of the canal era, and that'll be the end of the game. If you're tied, whoever has the most income will win, followed by the most money. And if it's still tied, congratulations, you're both great at business and you share the victory. And that's all you need to know to play Brass Birmingham. I hope it helps you get it to the table, and before I go, I want to give a huge thank you to Matthew Jude, Paula Deming, and Nick Murphy for their guest appearances on this video. They have a truly hilarious podcast called Death by Monsters. It's all about monsters, mysteries, and the unknown, and it's just a ton of fun, so please go check it out. You can start at any episode, but if you wanted to, you could jump in on the episode that I guest hosted, where I talk about hoaxes. Link in the description. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, I let my Patreon backers choose what I teach, and up next, they've asked me to cover Sidereal Confluence which I'm very excited about. Uh, if you want to vote on what games appear on the channel, get early access to strategy videos, or see a little behind the scenes clip of Matthew, Nick, and Paula filming their cameos, please head over to the Patreon and become a rules lawyer. Okay, that was more shilling than I usually do, so I'm gonna get out of here. Bye.